I'm starting this piece, one of the things that really helps me get through the first phrase is, um, obviously I'm starting in fourth position, but as I'm crossing the string, I go into a sort of a combined third, fourth stretch position. So the one is on the A, but three, four, I do go three, four, one, three a lot of the time. And for me, being able to stretch this is very important to get through this piece. Not just this phrase in the beginning, but throughout, just this access. Now, this position, the stretch position can feel quite far and it can be a bit of a strain on the hand, to be honest. So the key to, to using this position without getting tired for me is just lightness. Basically what I'm doing is keeping my hand very light and pivoting around my thumb, which is barely touching the neck. It's barely touching the neck and really the neck of the cello is as close to the inside of my hand as possible, sort of like a violinist. A lot of cellists are still playing today like kind of square hand and elbow out to here. And you know, for certain physiques and you know, for people with certain habits, I'm, I'm sure it, you know, that's you know, a good way for you. I would still recommend exploring what it feels like to bring this whole part of the arm down and closer to the instrument. Now, I wanna talk about the melody a little bit and share with you what I'm thinking about when I'm, when I'm playing this melody. Schubert is expanding on a very classical idea of starting a phrase or a melody with two shorter parts, and then he adds much longer parts. And now, this model in the simplest form is two plus two plus four. Now, in this melody, Schubert gets a little bit more romantic than that, in that each part is a little bit bigger, but the general proportions are the same. Now, this same structure is true of almost every phrase in this piece. So, as I approach this first phrase, it's beautiful, 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 until we hit like some obstacles, right? What is our first like basic obstacle? Now we can get really detailed and then talk about all of the things up until that point. But really they're up to interpretation and you know things like the string crossing and the open string, these are things that I think kind of uh, show our personality. Now after that, all of a sudden we have this large leap and it can feel like a bit of a technical difficulty, like an obstacle. When I was a, a very young student, I became pen pals with Mr. Starker, and he, I, he must have thought I was cute. I was, I was probably not ready, but he took me in, and he taught me a lot of things very early on, and one of the first things that I learned from Mr. Starker was the S shift. So, S for Starker, it's just S shift in my mind. But for me, I kind of draw an S or like that bottom part of the S, that curve, I draw it with my elbow. And that kind of alleviates, it takes the weight off my hand. So really it's about staying calm. And for me, that kind of reminder that, you know, gravity doesn't have that much control over my left hand, that comforts me. So I try to remind myself of that. And that's for me the very first mental obstacle in this piece. Now my, you saw my elbow do that here. It's right there. So I'm drawing kind of like a circle motion here and that's giving me, kind of propelling me up. So I don't have to go very fast at all. 
As soon as I hit the note, I start drawing the, the S. Now, the other part of that coin, the other side of that coin, is while I'm doing this, I want to stay very, very calm here. And if I were to just play a very legato line, I would just go... That would be the feeling in my, my right arm. So I try to just keep that. Now, this is a very large distance, so if I just keep that, you're gonna hear what you just heard, which, which is a slight break between this note and that, that note. Music is tricky. It doesn't just happen in space. It also happens in time. So while we are drawing this line, we have to accumulate for the extra energy here with just a little bit of passive energy here. So what I do is during the shift, I tell myself, use a little more bow than you think you need. Just a little bit. So with that in mind, I get that result, which I think is closer to how a singer would sing this phrase. So one more time. So once I do that, then I'm in a good place mentally to do the next thing. Similar concept here, but while I'm executing this shift, because I'm going up into this territory here and not this territory here, I give myself another mental check. I tell myself, you know, we're getting a little bit high, but nothing changes. Nothing is different from when you're playing down here. It's all in my mind. So I keep myself calm and I try to still prioritize the same exact things that I prioritize when I play down here. Without this calmness, this high note can usually, it can really stick out and it can really kind of like have the wrong feeling. So it's very important. to stay calm there. And then once you come down the arpeggio, it's very tempting to just kind of use the bow because we have a lot of bow now and it's gonna be a long note. And sure, you could change the, note, change the bow. That puts the mind somewhere not in an ideal spot for me. So I tell myself again, focus on the right thing, save bow, and instead of a whooshing sound, I really focus on this kind of a long, gradual crescendo. And, and focusing on that, for me, sets me up for the next part. Because without this mental pre preparation, again, that part of the phrase, which is like an extension of the two plus two plus four, the extension doesn't sound like it belongs anymore. It really doesn't sound like even the same character. So for me, and, and, and the technical execution of it, you, you become too focused and too obsessed on the one thing, and it takes away from the phrase. It actually takes away from the execution too, because when I'm not focusing on the right thing, and when I'm too concerned about one technical aspect, my hands get tense and you know, the points of isolation that I need are not there. So th usually I'm not isolating enough or I'm isolating too much and things like that happen when you become too concerned with a physical thing. So it's better to approach it, approach it from a musical standpoint and say, hey, instead of, Maybe I don't need that kind of sound because it says there's a forte piano on it and it's the top of a crescendo. Maybe I don't need that. Maybe, I mean, 
Maybe that's just the top of a, a, a hairpin with just like a slight emphasis on it. And that kind of thinking will give that kind of touch to the note. 